I guess we got to the wrong side. The stairs are on this side. <laughs> We're ready for our next presentation, and uh, I think you're really in for a treat. The gentleman is uh, known for educating and equipping the saints with what he calls God's vintage truth. He's a prolific writer, more than 30 books, including Wake the Bride, As It Was in the Days of Noah, The Coming Apostasy, and The End of America. His website is jeffkinley.com. Please welcome Jeff Kinley. Thank you so much, Derek. Appreciate that introduction, and um, I'll pay you later for that one. All right. Hey, I'm very excited to be back with you guys again uh, for another conference. How many guys were in the conference last year? Okay, good, good crowd. Uh, welcome, newbies. Uh, this is going to be fun. And it's my distinct privilege to be able to, um, uh, to welcome you right after lunch. That's always a great challenge for the speaker uh, to keep people's attention right after lunch. So with that in mind, uh, instead of me uh, trying to tell you some jokes or anything, I'm going to show you a little video that might orientate you a little bit to what we're going to talk about today. So take a watch. Many who say they have faith in Jesus can, and often do, deviate off course. This strain from the truth, or apostasy, represents an abandonment of faith. It can happen over time, even without a person realizing it. Pride, mixed with false doctrine, leads to an attitude of superiority, complacency, and self-righteousness. Without the anchor of the truth of the Bible, it is little surprise that many have become lost in a disorienting fog of political crisis correctness, and even a reimagining of God himself. But when we think biblically and stay on target with God and his word, we are less likely to drift aimlessly. In The Coming Apostasy, authors Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinley help expose the sabotage of Christianity from within and give you the tools you need to stay on course as you await Christ's return. A great apostasy is coming. Will you be ready? All right, The Coming Apostasy, that's my topic for today based on the book that Mark and I have co-written together. And, uh, you know, that, that dirt road there in that, uh, that video reminds me of the fact that we just last year relocated. We, we lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is the capital, uh, for the past 16 years. And, um, you know, the kids are now grown and uh, they're all married and having babies and that type of thing. And so my wife had this wild hair about uh, wanting to move to the country. And so, uh, you know, men, if, we're smart people, we men, and uh, we like to do what our wives tell us to do. So, uh, so we started looking for some property out in the country, and uh, we found, you know, this great piece of land, about, 20, uh, about, about 23 acres, about three hours north of Little Rock. And, and I thought, well, gosh, I've never, never lived out in the country before. I've never lived that far north of the city I don't know what life will be like, and so we, we purchased this, this property out there, and it's just beautiful. I can see the stars at night, and uh, I can hear the crickets, and, and uh, we just have a great time being out there together, but it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because my neighbors are, are people I call Mr. Groundhog and uh, Mr. Squirrel, you know, and uh, we've got deer that come in the backyard every night. It's uh, kind of fun, but uh, the closest town to us is a little town called Bergman, population about 412. There are no stoplights, there's one policeman that you have to watch out for, and a Dollar General store, and that's really about it. So, uh, so really, a kind of a fun day for the Kinleys is going into the next biggest town, which is about 12,000, and uh, going to Walmart, which I never thought I would do. I'll have to be honest to you. I've become one of those Walmart people. So if you see me, like on one of these videos, you know, the people of Walmart, then that's, that's my people now, you know, basically. So... I don't really know what that says about me, but, uh, but we are. We're loving uh, living in the country and just having a good time. I love the privacy. You know, I've officed uh, in, out of my home for the past 16 years in a little 10 by a 12 uh, office, and I loved it, but now I've got my own separate building on the property so I can kind of spread my wings a little bit and uh, pursue a little more creativity that way so the Lord has provided. So we're loving being a country folk now. I'd like to begin by reading a couple of verses to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 4 just to sort of set the stage and of course Paul is writing to young pastor Timothy here and he tells him uh, in verse 2 to preach the word preach the word be ready in season and out of season he says reprove rebuke exhort with great patience and instruction 
And here's why, Timothy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine anymore. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth. And they will turn aside to myths. But Timothy, you be sober. You do the work of an evangelist. You fulfill your ministry. I believe that we are obviously living in a world that is racing towards revelation. But at the same time, the church is also sailing through turbulent waters of her own. There are hidden reefs beneath the surface that are threatening the very life of the church. Hidden reefs of apostasy that threaten to undermine the faith of not only Christians, not only churches, but entire denominations that are falling prey to false teaching. Now before we go any further, let's look at this word uh, apostasy here. The word apostasy literally means to, to stand away from or to defect. It comes from two Greek words, apo, meaning away from, and histomy, meaning to stand. So apostasy means to stand away from something or to depart from something or to detract from something or to abandon something. And in this case, it's God's vintage truth. It's the whole counsel of God that he has given to us in the word of God. And so nowadays what we're, hap- what we're seeing is we're seeing the church now being driven by the winds of progressive theology, by the winds of political correctness, of postmodern thought, and a whole generation of self-appointed truth-tellers have, have arisen that are now leading the church astray and peddling these phony faith formulas that we see out there. You know, two weeks ago I was speaking up in um, upstate New York, and I flew back in the closest airport now, instead of being 10 minutes away from my house like it used to be, I'm an hour and a half away from the airport. So I have to get on the tractor. And t- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, have to, uh, I have to get in the car and go an hour and a half to the airport. And uh, so I was flying back into this airport, which is Springfield, Missouri. And coming in, well, we had some rough turbulence. And, you know, you've probably been in situations before where you kind of get white-knuckled on the airplane, and you're just praying to God that this guy up front knows what he's doing. You know, and that uh, it's not somebody that's too much younger than you. You know, the pilots are looking awful young these days. Uh, but, um, but I remember just thinking to myself, you know, I don't want a pilot that's just making this stuff up as he goes along. I don't want a pilot that's just trying to please himself. I want a pilot that's strict. I want a pilot that knows his stuff. And when I go to the pharmacist, I want a pharmacist the same way. I want them to follow the line. I want them to know what they're doing. And yet many times in the church today, we've got men in the pulpit who don't know what they're doing. They're playing fast and loose with the Word of God and producing what is really nothing more than just Sunday morning feel-good self-help messages. Jesus Christ in John 17, 17 prayed, God, I pray that you would not remove them from the world, but to sanctify them in truth. And then he said, your word is truth. You see, the Bible is our source of truth. It's our only real source of authority in this life. And we can appeal to people, we can appeal to books, we can appeal to to messages and to, to, to theology and systems of theology. But it boils right down to it, the Bible is our really only authoritative source of confident truth. Now, Paul knew this, obviously. And when he wrote to the Thessalonians... He wrote to them about some fake news that was going on in their day. You know, fake news is all the big thing today. And there's a lot of fake news. There's another word for fake news. It's called lies, you know. (laughs) We tend to kind of downplay things today. We just want to call it what we want to call it. It's just really lying. And we know who the father of lies is. And so there was fake news traveling around the church at Thessalonica. And, of course, much of what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians was apocalyptic, dealt with the end times, and dealt with preparing them for the end times. But look at what Paul wrote to them. He said, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's the blessed hope, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed by either a spirit, a message, or a letter, as if 
It's come from us, the apostles, the ones who speak for God, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So many of the Thessalonians were confused because these men had crept into the church and they were telling them that they were in the day of the Lord. The Thessalonians were experiencing persecution. They were going through hard times. And they're wondering, are we in this thing? And they're, yes, we're in the day of the Lord. Paul says, no, don't believe that. Paul wanted to comfort them and give them confidence, not spread more panic and confusion. And yet these false teachers continued with their deceptive message. In fact, the very next verse, he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, the day of the Lord, until first the apostasy comes and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. You know, it's very interesting, just going back to that, uh, that verse for just a second. You know, Paul talks about a spirit or a message or a letter. You know, in our day, it would be someone who claims to have a new vision, new revelation. Uh, someone who, who delivers a sermon, or you see him on TV, or a letter, I would say that would be more like a book someone's written. You know, it's very interesting, you go to the Christian bookstore, you go to even secular bookstores, and what you see on the shelves, you kind of makes you wonder about, you know, why are these books even being published? And we all know why they're being published, because they make money. That's why publishers publish books. And Paul says, I don't care what the book says. I don't care what the sermon says. I don't care what the supposed vision says. If it's contrary to the revealed body of truth that's in the Word of God, you dismiss it. It's a deception. And yet I find, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, that more and more Christians are becoming deceived by a lot of this false teaching and doctrine that's out there. Let me show you some of the, uh, the scriptures here uh, where Paul talks about this this coming apostasy, this falling away in the last days. 1 Timothy 4.1, he says, but the Spirit explicitly says, how much more clear can Paul be, right? That in the latter times, the later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And he goes on to describe what some of those teachings are. What about 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5? But realize this that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. But watch this last phrase, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied it's power. Well, that didn't sound like anything like the culture we live in, does it? <laughs> How did Paul know these things? It's almost like he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit. How about 2 Peter chapter 2? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> if this is really true. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. A couple more here. 2 Peter 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their own mocking, following after their own lusts, saying, where's the promise of his coming? I mean, you guys keep talking about this blessed hope thing. Where is it? It's not here yet, is it? So therefore, it must not be true. That's the logic that they use, the mockers. And then one more. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long ago beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this false teaching, this apostasy, this falling away from the true faith, from the Scripture, does it come announced? Does it come because someone on a Sunday morning says, hey, today we're going to take a shift now in our church. We're going to completely go apostate. That's what we're going to do. I mean, apostates, heretics don't ride in the back door of the church on brooms. 
with some maniacal laugh, you know, saying, ha ha, I've got you now, church. That's not how it happens, because they creep in unnoticed. But the Bible tells us that the last days will be marked by a falling away from the faith, and will prepare the world for the reception and the great deception of the Antichrist. It's merely paving the way. We're living in the midst of an age which exalts self-worship, moral relativism, and a malleable concept of truth. Truth no longer is truth in our world. You get to screenwrite your own reality now. Because what we've done, we've exalted the individual to the, to the status of being a god or a goddess. So we can say whatever we want to say, and it all of a sudden becomes true. It becomes reality, and guess what? It's not just reality for me, but it must be reality for you as well because you have to accept my new reality. So if I, as a 58-year-old man, want to identify as an 11-year-old boy, that, that's, a, that's a reality now that you have to accept. If I all of a sudden decide that I'm not a guy anymore, I'm, I'm a girl, I'm a woman, then that's something that our government has to say, well, I guess you are. If I say, well, I, I'm, I'm not a, a white male from Arkansas, I'm an Asian man from China, <laughs> then you just simply have to accept that. You know, if this were really true, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if you could just walk into the bank and say, I'm identifying as a millionaire today, <laughs> and I'd like to make a withdrawal, please? I don't know, 450000 will be enough to get me through the weekend, I think. My wife and I have got some plans. We want to see some places we've never seen before. And the bank just goes, well, that's your reality. <laughs> so this, this malleable idea of truth that we have crowned ourselves as little gods and according to our fantasies, our fleshly desires, our mental disorders, and our refusal to accept God's word as the only real thing we can trust in this life. But this way of thinking has also crept its way into the church. In a day and an age where you're not really allowed to know anything for sure, you can't be dogmatic about any truth because your way can't be the only way, especially as it relates to salvation and Jesus and the Bible. That kind of thinking has sort of crept its way into the church where now we're just sort of like presenting options to people. I mean, if you want to be like this, you can be like this, you know? And sometimes, you know, I'll be speaking in a, at a church or a denomination. I, I know that the denomination doesn't stand where I stand. And of course, I don't come in with a sledgehammer, but I still preach the truth. Because we have to preach the Word of God. Amen. In season... Out of season, that doesn't mean like there's preaching season, like duck season. That's not what that means. <laughs> it means when it's popular and acceptable and comfortable and during times when you're going to get some things thrown at you. You know, Jonathan Edwards was a man who was not afraid to preach against sin. And there were times when he would go and preach and they would throw things at him. They would throw rotten fruit at him. They would throw rocks at him. And one time it's rumored that someone even threw a dead cat at him. I call that dead cat preaching. <laughs> and we need a little more dead cat preaching today. You say, well, that's not very nice. Well, that's not going to win any friends. Guess what? We're not out to win friends. We're out to tell the truth in love, obviously, and let God worry about the friends. Let God worry about the end result. Well, we end up with this apostasy in the church, and, and most Christians today are clueless to this. They're clueless to the fact that whole denominations are going under, as far as the Scripture is concerned. And they see, you know, they see these, these few people that are sort of identified as kind of the, the targets for being kind of the laughing stock of being false preachers, you know, and we could, you know, name some of those names. Here's what most Christians see of, of apostasy, that, oh, it's just a little blip, on top of the water, yeah, we all know who they are type thing, right? But here's what reality is in our day and time. And the more exposure you have to Christendom in America and in other countries as well, and the more you travel around, the more you talk to people, and especially the more you see how the average Christian today is biblically illiterate, is doctrinally deficient, 
is theologically inept and therefore is spiritually weak. So we can't even stand up to some of the truth that's out there today. You know, I read in Ephesians 4 where the job of a pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of service. Why? So that we can grow up in all aspects into him and to be mature. And it says so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine upon the water. And guess what? Paul wrote that because there are winds of doctrine that blow. They blow this way, they blow that way, the wind changes on us. And guess what? The winds of culture have changed on you. They're blowing in your face now. We no longer have culture and society and at large the government to back us up, to have our six in terms of our Christian values and virtues and morality. That that ship has sailed. And so we have to decide we're going to stand for the truth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about false teachers and what I call shack Christians, okay? These these shack Christians I define as an entire generation of Christians who are swallowing idolatrous heresy about God through the tube of an emotional syrupy story. Okay, In other words, if I can touch your emotions, it doesn't matter what I say. I even heard a pastor recently talk about the fact that, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was talking about how he was talking to his congregation one day. He said, you know, I, I realize right now I've got you where I want you, in the middle of his sermon. I'm the guy with the microphone, okay? And so he said, I've got you right where I want you. Now, I could take several paths here. I could go to the next verse that we're preaching through, which is probably going to sting a little bit. Or I could just pause and tell you a story about my dog. You know, we loved old Shep. He slept at the end of our bed every night. He'd bring his tennis ball up on the bed and, you know, bring it to him. I'd throw it to him and stuff. And, you know, the day we, we, had, to, we had to take Shep in, it was, uh, and I'm looking out and everybody's crying, he says, Right? Did you realize Shep has nothing to do with the Word of God right now? It's just a story to grip your emotions. And there are tens of millions of Americans right now that they would rather you stroke their emotions and pluck their little heartstrings than you tell the truth about what the Bible says. Now, sometimes the Bible does stroke our our emotions. Sometimes the Bible does give us great comfort. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It comforts, but it also confronts. It wounds, but it also heals. And a good preacher, a good pastor is someone as he's going through the Bible that he realizes that's going to happen. And I can't can't predict the next verse. I can only tell you what God says. We have a whole generation of people that are so doctrinally deficient that they don't even realize they're being fed heresy. And they're believing things about God that are not true. And this false teaching is being slipped in, things like universalism, that everybody's going to be saved eventually. We'll talk more about that, more heresy here in just a second. But some of these rock star pastors, some of these celebrity bloggers, whose only credentials are that they have a huge following online. Now think about that for a second. I call them the Kardashians of Christianity. (laughs) You know? They're just famous for nothing. What have you ever really done with your life? other than get in front of a camera, right? Uh, Among other things. I'm reminded of what um, former pastor of megachurch Mars Hill Church said, Rob Bell, on Oprah. When he said this, he said, uh, concerning homosexuality, he said, the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it continues to quote letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. Anthony Campolo who was a spiritual advisor, a Christian sociologist, a spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton, came out as embracing gay marriage. We have these, as I said, celebrity bloggers, Rachel Held Evans, uh, Jen Hatmaker from HGTV, these huge Christian stars who have redefined gender roles. Paul Paul was really a, a chauvinist. He didn't really know what he was talking about. 
We need to embrace this whole idea of homosexuality and gay marriage. And even one popular blogger divorced her husband after marital problems and married another woman, a pro soccer player. This is just recently. In fact, the same woman came up, coined this phrase about reaching out uh, to homosexuals, which we should do, by the way. That's a whole other thing. We, we talk about that in the book. But she says, and even we need to reach out and love the, our precious little gay bees, babies who are born homosexual. She's even gone so far as to say. And millions are buying their works. It seems that all that's required of being an expert today is to simply have a computer and an Instagram account. And that qualifies you. But Jesus prophesied that in the last days, false teachers would come and they would lead many astray. These pretenders, these counterfeits, these wolves in sheep's clothing, and as I mentioned earlier, some whole denominations are going south, doctrinally speaking. There are some huge elements in the Episcopal faith, in the Methodist faith, obviously not all. There are other sub-denominations like the United Church of Christ and the United Methodist Church that have become co-sponsors of the gay gangs, the homosexual Olympics that they hold every four years. These and others have hijacked Christian values and virtues and reimagined them in light of a pagan culture that sees Jesus as just a little bit too harsh. So we have to make Jesus more palatable. We have to downplay the word of God for a new generation that simply doesn't accept scripture as their final authority. So you just have to reimagine God. If God's not who you want him to be, just think of him as somebody else. I always love it when people come to me and say, you know, I don't think God would. They fill in the blank. What makes you think your thoughts have any impact on what God would or wouldn't do? Or who he is? Isaiah 55 says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts. I says, I don't think like you. You don't think like me. If you want to find out what I think, go to my word. That's where you'll find it. And yet millions are doing this. And they've done this in terms of hijacking our Christian values and virtues. Let me just share with you some of these here. There's the Christian virtue of acceptance or tolerance. Unity and diversity, these are all Christian values, by the way. Compassion, justice, spirituality, anti-bigotry and prejudice, hatred, forgiveness, truth, sacrifice and martyrdom even. These are all things we find in the Word of God that are great values that we practice depending on the situation and the person, that type of thing. But look at all that list there, and can you see how they've been perverted? Can you see how they've been taken inside out? I have a whole chapter in the book we talk about when, when tolerance is intolerable. You know, people that are so open-minded, their brains are falling out, you know? <laughs> this acceptance, this idea of just op- such open diversity, and you know, diversity is a good thing. Diversity is a very good thing. But within the boundaries of God's moral law, obviously. And the Holy Spirit's revelation in Scripture. Isaiah 5, in verse 20, says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. So what does apostasy look like? Let's talk about that for a couple minutes. Basically, apostasy manifests itself in two ways, through false teaching and through ungodly living. In other words, there's doctrinal apostasy and there's moral apostasy. And some deny the faith and they leave the church. And you go, okay, that that makes sense. They've identified themselves. Others deny the faith and stay inside the church, seeking to, in their minds, reform it from within or try to move the faith forward some way. And so they begin denying or distorting or redefining some of the core doctrines of the faith. And this is what we're seeing in the spirit, in the message, and in the letters of today. We're seeing a denial or distortion of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. I had a worship leader one time. You know, I speak at these conferences and, and you know, they'll bring in a band or a worship leader and that type of thing. And I always make it a point to, to pray with those who are going to be, you know, doing the music portion of the program because I want them to know that, hey, we're a team in this thing. We're going to minister together. I can't, I can't tell you how many bands I've prayed with who've said, you're the first speaker to ever pray with us before uh, the conference. 
But I've had some worship leaders sometimes who've said things to me like, this, this idea of Jesus being punished on the cross, isn't that a bit brutal? I mean, isn't, you know, does that, doesn't that make God into some sort of just tyrant? The, the father would do that to the son? It's like, have you read the Bible? Have you read the penalty of sin? Have you ever talked about the wrath of God? The fact that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, Jesus Christ took hell for me on the cross. He took the blast of wrath from a holy God so that I could go scot-free. That's what Jesus did for me. He took that penalty. There's not an ounce of condemnation for you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has made us free, but it's like this whole idea of substitutionary atonement just causes people to scratch their heads. Or how about the inerrancy of Scripture? You know, the cry of the Reformers was sola scriptura. The cry of many today is sometimes scriptura, when it fits my preconceived notions about what God is. The whole idea of salvation by grace through faith. That's one of those doctrines of demons, by the way, that Paul talks about. When you add something to faith, when you try to make salvation a work, how about a literal hell, which many are denying today? The whole idea of literal hell and the fact that everyone goes to heaven, this idea of universalism, is rampant out there. And yet, now I don't know about you, I have had the distinct privilege of being under te- Bible teaching where I've gotten sound biblical teaching. But I get emails from people all the time that are just saying, Jeff, I'm in a church, and my pastor just, he won't preach the truth. What do I do? I said, well, you need to find a new church. (laughs) You know, I mean, you know, it's one thing to stay in the church. I mean, you know, some people have a high tolerance where they have a ministry in a church. I understand where you're going with that. You know, I'm okay. But other people are like, well, I don't know where I'm going to go. You know, we moved to this little community here. It's not even a community. It's a dirt road, okay? (laughs) We moved to this dirt road in North Arkansas. And and the biggest town near us, as I said, was about 12,000 people. I I told my wife, I said, I don't know what we're going to do for a church. I mean, you know, as they say in the South, the the pickings are slim. That's what we say. And and I I started just, you know, looking through the directory and trying to find, you know, I, I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, so obviously, you know, I come from that, that, that uh, theological persuasion, you know, and and lo and behold, in this tiny little town, I find a Dallas Seminary graduate who's past, pastoring a little church there. I, you would think I was, you know, a, a man of the desert running after a drink of water or something, you know. <laughs> Just made a beeline to this guy. I said, hey, man, here we are, you know. And he responded the same way. He's like, man, I've been waiting for somebody I can talk shop with, you know. He's like, finally, somebody I can just, you know, sit on the porch and we, we, let's talk about the bot, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, but I understand, you know, there's a, there's a famine in the land of preaching. And I thank God for the preachers and the pastors who are at this conference right now, who are faithful in delivering the word of God. Aren't you? I thank God for men like Mark Hitchcock and Tom Hughes and others who are here. And you know what? They're committed to the scripture. Now, they're relevant. They're funny. Some of them are just funny looking, you know. But they're relevant. I mean, they know how to deliver the truth in a language that people can understand. You know, so there are great churches. There are great pastors. But that's the tip of the iceberg. That's not the whole thing out there. How about the deity of Jesus Christ that they're denying? How about the return of Jesus Christ? Mockers will come saying, where is the promise of his coming? You know, it's very, very interesting as I talk to pastors and, you know, most of my ministry... Uh, is doing these little one-day discerning, discerning the times conferences, or I'll go and speak on my zombie killers thing to a youth conference, or, or go speak at a church and do a men's retreat or that kind of thing. It is amazing how many pastors are very, very hesitant to have someone come in and talk about prophecy. I mean, it's very, very sad. And I have a, a top 10 list in my book, The End of America, as to why I believe that's true, with the top 10 reasons why pastors don't preach on prophecy and certainly why they don't invite people in to do it. And I understand some of those reasons, but you know, guys are just afraid. They're just afraid. And so the return of Jesus Christ is something we don't even talk about that much. 
Our blessed hope, the thing that we're looking forward to more than anything, we don't even talk about. That's like leading up to a birthday or to a Christmas. We can't talk about it. It might happen sometime this month, but we can't talk about it here. It's that hidden joyful truth that fills our souls with rapture, pun intended. But let's just, let's just keep it, you know. Those crazy people, that they can talk about it. Jesus is the only way to heaven, and then the triune nature of God, the Trinity. Those are things that are doctrines that are up for grabs. Now, why do people apostatize? Why, why do average Christians, why do denominations, why do preachers even apostatize? I'll give you a couple reasons here. Number one, they love sin in the world too much. They're just at home. They don't think of themselves as aliens and strangers. They think, this is my home, this is where I belong. They've nailed those tent pegs down really deep, and they're, they're taking in everything that the world can give them, and you introduce this foreign concept coming from the Bible about truth that runs countercultural to their entire life and existence, and you become the unpopular one. So they just, they're used to sin in the world. Secondly, they compromise due to biblical illiteracy. You know, 19% of Christians read their Bibles once a month. 18% of Christians never read their Bibles, according to George Barna, according to Lifeway, rather. Never read their Bible. They don't crack open the Bible. It's decoration or a prop. But just as far as feeding themselves, it's just, it ain't happening for them. So it's no wonder that there's biblical illiteracy. And so when someone brings in a, a truth, a truth that, that sounds palatable, that gives me something to feel good about, maybe even it's a good principle, but maybe it came from Gandhi or some motivational speaker or maybe it sort of lines up with the Bible, and we go, that's my Christianity. They're biblically, functionally illiterate. And that's why we need to be in the Word daily. There's also just blatant defiance of God and His character. I, I know who the Bible says God is. I don't like it, and so I reject it. I'm going to reimagine Him. Jesus is too narrow. You know, Jesus spoke in John 7, or excuse me, Matthew 7, about the narrow road, the narrow gate that leads to a narrow road. He said, well, was Jesus being exclusionary about his claims that he was the Son of God? He certainly was. But once again, you want him to tell you that truth, if, if that indeed is the truth, which it is. You want your pilot to be very specific. You want your pharmacist to be that way. I had to go get a, um, a root canal. I can't even say it without getting in pain here about, I don't know, three or four months ago, and we had to drive to another town. Imagine that, to do that. I don't know, the farmer next door couldn't do that for me, I don't know. So we go to this town and stuff, and I go to this very nice office. They've got music playing and stuff. It's very just, you know, wood paneling and just very professional, nice receptionist. Everything's great. Doctors, it's great bedside manner. He's patting me on the shoulder. He could tell I'm one of those guys, right? He's patting me on the shoulder. He's like, Mr. Kinley, everything's going to be just fine didn't matter because when it comes to the dentist and root canals and that kind of thing man I'm telling you uh, you're gonna have to give me everything in your arsenal <laughs> what you got back there <laughs> will it go in my vein stick it in <laughs> you got something you can put over my face go for it <laughs> you got a swig of something back you know whatever right and, and I'm one of those guys, I go one step further, man, I, I, I get on my phone, I, I make this special music mix, you know, I stick it deep in my ears, I'm like, man, I'm cranking that sucker up, I mean, put on like the psychedelic mix, I don't care, you know, laughing gas, take me to another universe, I'm fine, I'm battling six-headed aliens on Venus, I don't care, but I don't want to feel that pain, you know, guess what, there's, sometimes the truth is painful, and especially in a culture that has postured itself to be completely against the Word of God, many things in the Word of God are going to be painful. And yes, there are many things that give people comfort as well. We should obviously preach that. Jesus said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. There's great comfort in Christianity, but you have to be confronted with your sin first. That, that self-God within must be confronted by the King of Kings who wants to rule on that heart. And so 
some people see Jesus as too narrow, and then finally they just love the praise and approval of men. Now, as we kind of bring this thing to a close, let's talk about some scripture that answers the question, does truth and doctrine really matter? Let me clip through some of these scriptures and maybe jot the reference down or take a screenshot, whatever. But here's some that Paul wrote, 1 Timothy 4, 6. And pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine you have been following. Nourished on truth. Nourished. That means you're you're consuming it, that, that it gives you strength. It enables you to go on. You know, I tell people, it's like, how many of us literally forget to eat? Do you ever forget to eat? Now, sometimes you may be at work, you've worked through a lunch, and you're like, oh, gosh, I forgot to eat. It's 2.30, I forget, forgot to eat. You might forget to eat through lunch, but you're not going to forget to eat for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right? You know why? Because your body has this incredible mechanism called hunger. That's right. And it tells you, you dummy, you need to eat something. Put something in me. I need energy. I need, be, need to be nourished. Yet we do that with our physical bodies. You know why? Because there are these obvious signals, right? We need to be spiritually sensitive to our spirits to realize my spirit is malnourished. My spirit is parched. My spirit is thirsty for you, O oh God. And to be nourished in the words of sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine than we've given you. It does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. He is conceited and understands nothing. <laughs> I don't care how many degrees he's got in his name, how many books he's written, he's arrogant and stupid. That's what Paul says. How about 2 Timothy 3? But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. You know, I've been a Christian for a long time. 42 years I've been a Christian. Since at age 16, a fellow classmate at T.L. Hannah High School in Anderson, South Carolina, befriended this drug-dealing hippie and led me to Jesus Christ. And there's not a, a year that goes by that I don't pick up the phone on October 5th and call him and say, thank you. Thank you for showing me what Jesus looks like. Thank you for leading me to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a different man today. And you know what? Nobody even knows his name. He's just a guy my age. And whatever I've been able to do by the grace of God in my ministry, guess what? I've traced it all the way back to somebody who really cared about me. He cared. And I continue to learn now. I haven't learned it all. I haven't arrived. Guess what? I'm still learning just like you are. Paul was still learning. Paul was still struggling. When he wrote Romans 7 about the struggle with the flesh, he'd, been, he'd known Jesus over 20 years. What, did he have post-traumatic Damascus Road syndrome or something? <laughs> no, he was a believer that struggles like we all do. He's continue to learn and to grow. How about Titus? 1, 9 through 10, but holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he, the elder in this case, will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Jude 17 and 19 says, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they were saying to you in the last days, There will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, who are worldly-minded. They're even devoid of the Spirit. So Jude even says, they don't even have the Holy Spirit. Why else would they be coming up with these fleshly, man-made ideas contradicting Scripture? The Spirit doesn't contradict Himself, by the way. So that's where this source is coming from. So this discernment that we get becomes like a, a radar for us, a doctrinal radar. Does truth and doctrine really matter? Sound doctrine here reveals the character of God. You want to know why doctrine matters? Why it matters that we stick to the Bible? Because it reveals the character of God. It leads us to worship in spirit and in truth. It nourishes us in the faith. It helps us recognize false teaching. It destroys strongholds of unbiblical ideas. It empowers us to contend for the faith, and it enables us to guard against wolves. I don't know if we put that that slide up on the screen there. 
but all these things are worth being committed to Scripture on what this doctrine of sound teaching does to us and for us. In closing, biblical discernment is what we need to be pursuing. Truth and doctrine motivate us to pursue biblical discernment. Instead of being swept up into the the sea of the apostasy that is swirling all around us, we need biblical discernment. That's, I call that a life skill. It's not something you get at a conference. <laughs> not something you get, you know, just handed to you. Someone says, I, I'm going to give you discernment for your birthday. That's not how it works. It's a life skill. And, and the author of Hebrews says it's people that, who have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I like that. Trained, that growth. You know, the more you grow, the stronger that you can get. And then the second thing that truth and doctrine motivate us to pursue is personal purity and passion for Jesus Christ. That personal purity purity that we would be ready for the return of Jesus, as 1 John 3 tells us, and as Revelation 2 and 3 tell us, the churches who had lost their love, lost their edge, they'd allowed that false doctrine to creep in. They'd become tolerant of Jezebel and of her ungodly teachings. And the church at Ephesus had lost their passion for Jesus. Can you think of a time in your life when you were more passionately in love with Jesus Christ than you are today? You know, maybe, maybe you slipped a little bit in your love for Christ. But the more we immerse our minds in the Word of God, the more we are passionate about Him. The Word of God always leads us to the person of God. He's never an end in itself. Uh, and you know, prophecy, I mean, I talk about in Wake the Bride, 15 perks of prophecy back in the, in the appendix, and, and just about how prophecy does so much for us in our practical daily lives. But we have to make sure that we are in the Word so that we can be equipped in our own hearts. You know, years ago, I was a pastor at a, this megachurch down in Mobile, Alabama. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Mobile or not. Mobile is not the end of the world, but I could see it from my back porch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, it was just right on the edge of Neverland, whatever. And uh, one of the things that we did in my youth, it was one of these ministries where they, they, they gave me a, a huge budget to play with, and so they gave me all this money, and so I said, all right, we're going to do something fun for our youth. So we got about, I don't know, all these high school and college students together. We rented out the USS Alabama battleship, okay? You just rent the battleship. Now, we didn't get to take it out on the sea, but we rented it, and we had these, you know, kind of spiritual war games and that kind of thing, and toward the end of our time that night on Friday night, this young girl came to me, and she said, Pastor Jeff, I've got a problem. I said, what is it, sweetie? She said, I'm I'm sick. Like, what, what are you sick of? She says, it's all this rocking back and forth on the ship. It's just made me nauseous. I think I might throw up. I looked at her. I said, sweetheart, the USS Alabama is 42,000 tons of ship that is anchored in concrete in Mobile Bay. <laughs> Honey, the ship ain't moving back and forth. It's all in your mind. I said, don't trust what you feel. Trust what you know. So trust what we know, not what we feel. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your great word that gives us truth, that is light in life, is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path uh, that gives us all that we need for faith and godliness in this life. We love you. Thank you for these dear, precious people who love you as well. May we together be a shining and burning light for Jesus Christ, and may we be part of the church that calls her back to that purity of doctrine, and most of all, a love for you in light of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.